Welcome to Paranormality Magazine. Each week, Paranormality Magazine explores all Fortean subjects, from phantoms to UFOs and every cryptid creature in between. Each week, you're treated to a collection of well-researched and investigated stories, interviews, and reports on cutting-edge paranormal projects and topics they know you crave. And here in the podcast, I share stories from the magazine to give you just a taste of what you receive in every issue. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Paranormality Magazine. Fairy tales have been enchanting audiences for centuries, whisking us away to far-off lands filled with magical creatures, heroic adventures, and timeless morals. From the Brothers Grimm to Hans Christian Andersen, these stories have captivated generations with their charm and wonder. However, behind the glittering surface of these beloved tales lies a dark and haunting origin that often goes unnoticed. Here, we'll dive deep into the sinister undercurrents of classic fairy tales, unearthing the unsettling truths that lurk beneath their whimsical facades. Let's start our journey with the Brothers Grimm, renowned for their collection of fairy tales that include classics like Snow White, Cinderella, and Hansel and Gretel. These stories, though delightful to modern readers, have their origins in much grimmer folk traditions. The Grimms drew heavily from German folklore, where tales were often brutal, filled with violence, and meant to convey harsh life lessons. For instance, Cinderella in its original form had no fairy godmother, but instead featured a mutilation scene in which Cinderella's stepsisters cut off parts of their feet in order to be able to fit into the glass slipper. The violence and cruelty in the early versions of these tales reflect the harsh realities of the times in which they were born. Hans Christian Andersen is another celebrated author of fairy tales, but one of his most beloved stories, The Little Mermaid, conceals a profoundly dark undercurrent. In the original tale, the Little Mermaid gives up her voice and endures agonizing pain to gain legs and a chance at love with a prince. When her love remains unrequited, she faces a tragic fate, dissolving into sea foam and becoming a mere whisper in the wind. This poignant story speaks to themes of self-sacrifice, unrequited love, and the painful transformation one undergoes for the pursuit of an unattainable ideal. Anderson's The Little Mermaid is a haunting exploration of the price one might pay for love and the longing that can consume a person's soul. Snow White, one of the most cherished fairy tales of all time, conceals a deeply unsettling message about beauty and jealousy. The Wicked Queen's obsession with her own appearance and the desire to be the fairest of them all leads her to attempt the murder of her stepdaughter Snow White. The use of a poisoned apple and the act of putting Snow White in a death-like slumber is a gruesome twist on the traditional princess tale. This tale raises questions about the societal pressure placed on women to confront the certain beauty standards and the dangerous consequences of jealousy and envy. It reminds us that beauty, when coveted to an extreme, can turn deadly. Hansel and Gretel is another grim tale from the Brothers Grimm that takes us deep into the forest, where a wicked witch lures children with the promise of sweets before attempting to cook and eat them. This story has been interpreted as a cautionary tale against gluttony and the dangers of venturing into the unknown. However, it also delves into themes of abandonment, survival, and the harshness of life in a world where parents must make difficult choices to ensure their own survival. The dark forest symbolizes the uncertainty and peril that often lurks at the edges of our familiar world. Little Red Riding Hood is a cautionary tale about the dangers of talking to strangers. In the story, the wolf tricks Little Red Riding Hood by disguising himself as her grandmother, ultimately devouring her. The message is clear trust should not be placed blindly in those we do not know well. While the message is an essential one for children, the story also serves as a reminder of the dangers that exist in the world and the importance of vigilance and discernment when interacting with unfamiliar individuals. Beauty and the Beast, 
a story of love and transformation, it has enchanted audiences with its message of inner beauty triumphing over outward appearance. However, beneath the enchantment lies a more profound exploration of the beastly nature within us all. The curse that transforms the prince into a beast is a metaphor for the hidden darkness and potential for cruelty that resides within even the most outwardly beautiful people. It reminds us that true love requires accepting and taming the beast within ourselves and others. Fairy tales are like mirrors, reflecting the fears, hopes, and moral dilemmas of the societies that birthed them. They serve as cautionary tales, morality plays, and vehicles for exploring the human condition in all its complexity. While these stories may seem whimsical on the surface, their haunting origins reveal a deeper, more profound truth about the darkness that can reside in the human heart. As you revisit these classic tales, it's essential to remember fairy tales are not just stories for children. They are timeless narratives that challenge us to confront our own fears, desires, and unsettling truths that lie hidden beneath the surface of our seemingly ordinary world. So the next time you open a fairy tale book, take a moment to appreciate the dark and haunting origins of these classic stories, and you may find a deeper connection to their enduring magic. A new study led by Dr. Sam Parnia and his colleagues at NYU Langen Health has provided comprehensive evidence suggesting a correlation between brain patterns observed in dying patients and commonly reported near-death experiences, or NDEs, such as lucid visions, out-of-body sensations, and life reviews. The study involved 567 patients in 25 hospitals worldwide who underwent cardiopulmonary resuscitation CPR, after cardiac arrest. Electroencephalogram EEG brain signals from these patients revealed heightened consciousness episodes occurring up to an hour after cardiac arrest, with some patients reporting awareness during CPR and NDEs, may trigger a state of disinhibition in the brain, facilitating an enhanced understanding of new dimensions of reality, including deeper consciousness, memories, thoughts, intentions, and ethical perspectives. This finding has profound implications for fields such as CPR research, end-of-life care, and the study of consciousness. It challenges the notion that the brain permanently dies within minutes of oxygen deprivation and suggests that it can recover function even after an hour. The study's results align with a growing body of research on the experiences of dying individuals, revealing surges of brain activity during death and common themes and NDEs reported across different cultures and backgrounds. The researchers emphasize that these experiences are distinct from dreams or hallucinations and conclude that they emerge uniquely with death, representing a genuine phenomenon. Future research aims to provide a more detailed understanding of the neurophysiology of life and death as individuals transition through these states. I was recently watching a live on TikTok with Dana Marshall from 103.3 WKFR in Kalamazoo, Michigan, where he was staying at the Henderson Castle, which is haunted and there were people in the live talking about spooky stories, and one of them that I saw was Leelani, which we ended up messaging on TikTok, and she shared the following story with me. So this was back in maybe 2017 or 2018, she said. I was on the phone with my cousin, and we were talking about Ouija boards and the fact that they were created by a game company and it allowed children to play with them. My cousin and I were talking about how crazy it was because Ouija boards can be so dangerous, and allowing children to play with it is even worse in my opinion, and we'd had some spooky stuff happen, but nothing where we felt it was paranormal. But that night on the phone I kept hearing this laugh, and I thought it was my cousin doing it, and I told him to stop, and he said he wasn't doing anything, and then he was hearing a laugh on his end. But his was a female laugh and mine was a male laugh. I texted somebody that I know about it who is really into paranormal stuff and said, have you ever had any experience with things like that? And my friend said no, and it was very strange with what was going on. 
So I told my cousin, let's just restart our phones and call each other back. So that's what we did. And the laughing kept happening. And I remember I'd said, someone, please help us. And all of a sudden, you could hear a man whisper, help us, in a mocking tone. And I had taken a picture of my room on flash, and you could see orbs in it. Then, all of a sudden, my cousin's Amazon Echo randomly went off and said, activated intruder mode, even though none of us said any of the trigger words or anything like that. There are many stories in the paranormal community where spirits have messed with communications, whether that be telephone calls or radios. This short story seems like that is what happened. An entity was interfering with a phone call, and then decided to mock them. Irish Schaefer sent in their story to Paranormality Magazine about their house in Berwyn. We moved into the house when I was six years old. I always had a strange feeling about the attic bedroom that I and two of my brothers shared. One left in two years for the Navy and marriage. The other, 15 years older than I, stayed until he was 30, going to college and later working at a famous retailer. This remaining brother thought tarot cards and the Ouija board were toys and used them extensively. I always felt a presence in the attic room. This presence would seem to be in the room when the lights were off. I often felt that a person was watching me. The feeling was very frightening and evil. I often slept with my head covered. The basement was always a frightening place after dark, and sometimes during the day. I could feel but not identify a presence in the basement. The doorway between the kitchen, which also had the entrance to the basement, and the dining room often felt crowded after dark. I simply felt that when I passed through that area, I was passing through a group of people. When I was about 12 in 1976, I opened my eyes to see a man dressed in a blue sequined tuxedo and top hat come out of the closet and climb onto the foot of my bed. I covered my head, and the entity left. I told no one about the incident. The next day, my mother described the same entity in her bedroom at the foot of her bed. He was dressed exactly the same as the entity in my room. I never mentioned the incident to either of my parents, even though it was obvious that Mom had been visited by the same entity as me. We left that house in 1983. I've lived in many places in a few different cities during my lifetime. It is not unusual for me to be transported back to the house in Berwyn in my dreams to be plagued by an entity. I've even had encounters with entities in other places where I've lived. In one place in another city, I remember feeling the pressure of an entity lying heavily on top of me. I felt the pressure of someone sitting on the end of my bed. I once saw a beautiful blonde woman come to my bedroom door in still another city. She also sat outside my living room window one night in my current city. They are the same city, though I think she may have been Resurrection Mary. I deal with these entities by asking that the Lord God send out His holy guardian angels to protect me. I'm now 59 and still experience the disturbances and dreams associated with the house in Berwyn. A quiet Scottish village has gained notoriety as a hotspot for UFO sightings, according to a prominent ufologist. Malcolm Robinson, one of Scotland's leading experts in the field, has spent decades studying UFO phenomena and has penned ten books on the subject. Robinson asserts that Scotland has been a UFO hotspot for years, with the famous Falkirk Triangle being a particularly popular location for UFO enthusiasts. However, he believes that the coastal village of Mucalls in Aberdeenshire is an even more significant hub of extraterrestrial activity. Mucalls, home to around 500 residents, is described by Robinson as a UFO window area where numerous unexplained sightings have occurred over the years. In his book, UFO Case Files of Scotland, Volume 2, Robinson recounts some of the astonishing stories shared by locals. One of the earliest accounts dates back to 1964, 
when a motorist, accompanied by his brother and mother, claimed to have pursued a bizarre ball of light through McCall's and the nearby Hamlet Bridge of McCall's before it suddenly vanished. Another eerie incident took place in December 1971, when a resident named Tom Moyer, who lived in the western part of the village, reported encountering three strange lights and a figure dressed in a long gown while walking home in the dark. Tom and his sister allegedly observed these lights in the same location for several years until he left for college. Between 1988 and 1922, Tom continued to revisit his home in Mukalls to document the strange phenomena before relocating to New Zealand. His accounts prompted others to come forward with similar experiences, including an encounter with the gowned figure in 1968. Even a local minister residing next door to Tom seemed aware of these incidents, casually suggesting that a peculiar-looking bolt Tom found could have come off one of those spaceship things. Remarkably, when Robinson's book was published in 2011, reports of UFO sightings in McCall's had significantly declined. Robinson noted the decrease in reported cases and expressed curiosity about the reason behind this decline. Robinson stated, "...today's McCall's, as far as we are led to believe, sees very little in the way of UFO reports, and we can but wonder why. McCall's, for some unknown reason, has joined the ranks of other British locations that have seen UFO activity, and we thank Tom Moyer for sharing his UFO accounts with us." He also emphasized the credibility of Tom Moyer's accounts, describing him as an intelligent individual, accustomed to identifying common aircraft and helicopters, but the objects he witnessed in McCall's were beyond conventional explanations, leaving him with lasting memories of those experiences. Bob Bigelow has stated that extraterrestrial beings are living among us humans. He said he is absolutely convinced aliens live among humans on Earth. During an interview with CBS's 60 Minutes, reporter Lara Logan asked Bigelow if he believed in aliens. He replied, I'm absolutely convinced. That's all there is to it. He later stated, There has been and is an existing presence, an ET presence. He added, I spent billions and millions and millions. I probably spent more as an individual than anybody else in the United States has ever spent on this subject. You don't have to go anywhere to find aliens, and they are here right in front of people. Bigelow had his own close encounters, but declined to mention anything else. When George Knapp, an award-winning journalist, was asked to comment during this interview, he said, There are different ways to go at this. So one is from a hardware standpoint. The other one is from the standpoint of presence, ET presence. And, you know, a lot of people say, well, whether they're, you know, that they can be among the population, whether they're hybrids or they're some other kind of really look-alike, you know, kind of thing. But so, so you can look at it in different kinds of ways. And so I know of a really good, high-quality researcher who has fantastic academic credentials and background and he would be predisposed to the latter, saying that yeah, it could be among us, you know, but he's probably on the more extreme. He's definitely on the more extreme. Others would say, well, we're safe in saying that there's hardware, you know, so that's among us and hardware kind of context. As any UAP or UFO aficionado will know, Bigelow owned and operated Skinwalker Ranch in the Uintah Basin in Utah, which is a massive crater from an asteroid impact. He owned this property until 2016 when he sold it secretly to Brandon Fugel, a real estate mogul from Utah. Skinwalker Ranch ended up as a multi-series show on the History Channel called The Secret of Skinwalker Ranch and Beyond Skinwalker Ranch. All sorts of mysterious phenomena have been recorded there, both by Bigelow and Fugel. Most of what Bigelow's team documented has been kept secret. You can read George Knapp's book, Hunt for the Skinwalker, co-written with Colm A. Kelleher, about events that happened to the ranch owners before Bigelow bought it. These well-documented events are what convinced Bob Bigelow to purchase the property in 1996. Skeptics believe the evidence recorded at the ranch is simply a misunderstood natural phenomenon or a complete intentional hoax. The debate regarding this is hotter than ever, especially after the television series came out. 
Bob Bigelow's often shared his personal experiences and losses that piqued his interest in life after death and the UFO phenomena. He talked about possible links between consciousness research and UFOs. He also discussed the considerable risks of communicating with the unknown, saying, "...that's been mainly what I've been doing except for the Skinwalker Ranch thing for 20 years as the space world has been huge in my life to pursue the legitimate, parochial kind of, you know, using fire engines, rockets to get you there." We didn't expect anything like this to happen, and so there, this is different. This is the Holy Grail, and is different than the second Holy Grail. If the second one is beings, E.T., then the first one, is there any part of your consciousness that survives your bodily death? That's a big deal. That's a huge story. That's gigantic. Be a little careful about what you wish for. So on the face of it, communication sounds great, and that, by the way, has been tried forever, ever since the Oracle of Delphi. I mean, you can go back thousands of years and that's been attempted. So it's not now, you know, the last 100 years through electronics and using some kind of electrical apparatus to try to have some kind of communications. And you know communication can be at all different kinds of levels. There might be communication that just causes you an awareness. Bigelow's strong political influence has helped significantly when it comes to UFO study. He once convinced his friend and then-Democratic U.S. Senator Harry Reid to allocate $22 million to the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program, or ATIP, which investigated UFO and UAP reports from 2007 to 2012. Most of these funds were sent to Bigelow's private property to investigate the strangeness, and the allocation was not publicly known until the 2017 New York Times investigation. The Pentagon states that the program was terminated in 2012 although Harry Reid later said that he was not ashamed about the costs. Later, he and his team hired dozens of investigators, scientists, and support staff to assemble a vast database of original investigations and UFO files from other countries. The now-famous 2004 Tic Tac encounter off the coast of Southern California was one of the first and most significant cases that BAASS investigated. There have been theories floating around for decades that Bigelow's influence on government investigations is far stronger than led on. One such example is that the hidden evidence is in the government's UFO-slash-UAP files, which have yet to be declassified. How much longer until we know exactly what has happened at Skinwalker Ranch? Will Bigelow's organization be partly responsible if the government ever admits there is life elsewhere? Perhaps only time will tell. Thanks for listening to Paranormality Magazine. Get more information about the magazine and subscribe to our monthly publication at ParanormalityMag.com. That's ParanormalityMag.com. Or click the link in the show description. And if you're a researcher or investigator, send us your stories. We might feature you in our next issue. If you have a paranormal podcast, you can add it to our website so our readers can find your show. And artists, if you'd like your work to be featured in our magazine or on our back cover, contact us. Again, our website is paranormalitymag.com. I'm Darren Marlar, and I'll have more paranormal for you next time from Paranormality Magazine.